Jonathan sat trembling in the dark. He stared at nothing, his eyes not penetrating the circle of blackness that surrounded him, a single lamp illuminating the round table he sat at, allowing him enough light to see the edges of it, and nothing more. A teapot and a half-empty cup sat in the center. With trembling hand, he reaches towards it and took it toward his lips. Not truly looking at it as he drank, he set the cup down on the plate. The cup rattled against it, the only sound save the thunder that rumbled in the distance. He heard a switch flick. Jonathan shut his eyes for a moment, temporarily blinded by the harshness of the light that filled the room. That he opened them again to see a small, white kitchen. A single window, two doors broke the array of cabinets that covered the walls. Standing in the open was Chris, Jonathan's friend and housemaid. He had a hand on the light switch. John, what are you doing? It's after midnight, Chris asked. Jonathan kept staring forward and didn't reply. John, answer me. This is the third time I caught you up like this. What are you doing? After that moment's pause, John replied, speaking in a dry, quiet voice. I had th that dream again. He still stared, unblinking towards the window, though he didn't seem to notice what was behind it. Chris flinched. For months now, John has been experiencing the same recurring dream. In it, he stood outside his own life, looking in at it. He saw himself live every day, going through the same daily routine and experiences over and over again. However, something about it seemed unreal. All his actions were artificial. All his conversations seemed planned. A strange feeling that something wasn't quite right filled him and grew and grew. And so, gradually, he barely noticed his actions were replaced with words. Instead of seeing things happen, he read them in a massive wall of text that described his every movement. His conversations came in quotation marks, which he read instead of spoke. Soon, his entire life seemed to be a novel, running forward towards a conclusion that was always surrounded in haze. When he got to the end, he always awoke, but the feeling never left. Even sometimes when he was awake, he began to lose his feelings of normality. For brief moments, barely noticeable, he saw objects described in text rather than their own form, and his own movements seemed to be described by a nameless narrator. Chris sighed and walked forward. He rested his hand on Jonathan's shoulder and spoke in a reassuring voice. Listen, John, I know you're worried, but you have to remember, it's just a dream. You've been very stressed lately and started having nightmares. It happens, and it's nothing to worry about. Jonathan chuckled silently. <laughs> oh no. No, no it isn't. What do you mean? Look, John. Get back to sleep. You're starting to worry me. For the first time that night, Jonathan stood and faced Chris. He was taller than Chris, and the shadow he cast obstructed Chris's face. Don't tell me you haven't had that feeling. That creeping, inching suspicion that everything isn't right. Doesn't everything seem too dramatic, too convenient? This isn't how reality should be. This isn't how people should speak. This isn't how they act. Jonathan realized he was shouting and stopped. He had knocked over his teacup, shattering it onto the floor. His breath, heavy, and tried to calm down. Resting his head in his hands, he sat down again. Chris looked at him with worried eyes. All right, John. Here's what we're going to do. You just go back to sleep for now. Tomorrow, we're going to make an appointment with Dr. Limestone. He's helped you with your dreams before. And no, I'm not going back to Dr. Limestone. She isn't going to fix this. She isn't going to solve the problem. She isn't a part of it. And I don't even think she's a character. John, what are you talking about? A character in what? The book. Y you don't get it yet. It doesn't know it's a comedy or a drama or what, but we're all a part of it, and I don't think she is. That was the most horrifying part of his dreams. He felt as if hundreds of eyes were reading the text along with him. 
learning his every movement as if they were plot points in a story. He still had the feeling at this very moment that in a strange, twisted way, he was being watched. Chris stared at him, not knowing what to say. Jonathan turned to face him, holding his hands out in front of himself as he pleaded Chris to understand. Look, isn't this all just too convenient? Doesn't it ever feel that way? Listen to that thunder. Doesn't it seem like it's a perfect setting and everything is like that? The lights, when you entered, the teacup, by God, even the way I'm standing, this isn't how things work. They don't come together to make themes. Weather shouldn't suit my mood like this. Don't you see it? Chris was taken aback. Well, uh, John, that, that's all just ridiculous. Storms happen. Whether you're angry or not, the teacup was an accident. and We can get a new one. Now, what is this about Dr. Limestone? What do you mean she isn't a character? Jonathan went back, holding his head in his hands. I, I know I'm not going to see the doctor because she hasn't been described. I have no idea what she looks like. What? If this was real life, then there would be hundreds of little insignificant things happening. I would know dozens of people on important details, but this isn't real life, and anything that isn't a part of the story won't be described. I'm not going to see Dr. Limestone. Outside of this conversation, she doesn't exist, and we don't even know what she looks like. John, that's ridiculous. This is besides the point. Really? Describe her. Chris opened up his mouth to respond and stopped. He realized he truly had no idea. Well, she was a psychiatrist that helped me with the dreams before. Is that what you were going to say? Because it was established for this conversation. You have no idea what she looks like, do you? Chris paused. That was exactly what he was going to say, down to referring to Jonathan in third person. It didn't seem hard. Well, that doesn't mean anything. We must have just forgotten, that's all. We haven't seen her in months. Anyway, it isn't important. What is important is that, Chris said, Stop trying to rationalize what shouldn't be. There's no reason for us not to know what she looks like. It's just a freaking plot device. That's all it is. Even what you just did there. Trying to change the topic just to hide the parts that hadn't been fleshed out. This isn't how people act, Chris. Well, all right. That still doesn't mean anything. It's just one person. Oh, really? Describe our neighbors to me. Describe your parents. Describe anyone who isn't directly related to this conversation. And I will believe you. Chris stared back at him in shock. Not knowing what to say, he searched his mind for anything. For his neighbor's face. For his parents' image. And found nothing. Over and over again, he tried. And came up blank. Well, oh god, I don't know. Maybe we're just tired, said Chris. Thank you, Christ, the Savior who shines into the darkness. <laughs> nice imagery there. Eh, just like the storm. All right, then. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I don't know. That's, that's not important. Exactly. It's not important. We don't know anything that isn't directly important. Why is that? Why the hell should that be? It's just too goddamn convenient. Look, this is actually a house we've been living in. You should be able to answer me this question at least. What is behind that door? Jonathan pointed towards the closed door at the other end of the kitchen. Ah, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Exactly. There's no reason for two people who have lived in a household for years to not know what's behind a single door. It just wasn't relevant when you turned the lights on, so it wasn't described. All right, John. All right. Say you're right, and we're just in a story. What then? Do we open the door? I don't know. It is there for a reason now. We have drawn attention to it. Now there has to be something important. Oh, God. So now you think talking about things can influence the freaking universe? That's insane! No, it must be. Look, it's like the tea. I had the tea so that the rattling glass and my broken cup 
could be represented by my emotions. Now, we must have drawn attention to the door. It must represent something. This is how it works, yes? You turning on the light, flooding light into my darkness. But I denied it, and it put you in my shadow. For a second, he closed his eyes, and he hadn't seen Chris hit the switch. But the words, he had his hand on the light switch, flooded into his mind in black lettering. It's all foreshadowing. So, when the kitchen had two doors, one opened up and one closed, there was something important behind the closed one. Shevov's gun, right? You came in to help me sort out this in part one. Part two occurs behind that door. Well, then should we open it? I don't know. We don't know what's behind it. We don't even know what type of story it is. That's true. It could be a drama. An action? A comedy? That wouldn't be too bad. Perhaps this is all just a big joke. Really? You want to live in a comedy? Do you realize people would be laughing at us? Our every move? What if we are just two buffoons for people to mock? God, if we were just two cartoonish idiots, would we even have the intellect to tell? Uh, I hadn't thought of that. It is still better than a tragedy. I, I don't know. Look, we can work this out. It can't be an action. Neither of us really knows how to fight or carry weapons. Jonathan spoke, realizing he established it as fact as he said it. I don't think it's a comedy, because we would probably be able to remember funny things happening. Then again, maybe we wouldn't, as part of the plot. I don't know. Hopefully it's a drama, or a romance. I imagine this entire thing was just to set us up with some perfect woman, Chris said hopefully. I, I don't know. Look, we should be able to tell what this is from our surroundings. The writing and the description should reflect what the plot is. We should see foreshadowing. Maybe we could pick it out. A slow realization began to dawn on Jonathan. Though he kept guessing, in his heart he knew exactly what sort of story was behind it. All right, well then. What can we learn from this kitchen? Chris asked. Jonathan thought for a moment. Everything in this conversation, and everything we talked about, revolved around myself. I think it is safe to say that I am the main character here. All right, Chris said, nodding and following along. Then what has happened to you recently? I'm worried, Chris, with the thunder and the darkness, the nightmares, the falling cup. I don't think. This is a happy story. Something bad's going to happen. It is going to happen soon. As he spoke, thunder once again boomed on the horizon. The flash of lightning filled the window with jagged light. Chris swallowed. All right, then. Do we open the door? Neither of us knows what's behind it, and I think it's safe to say we weren't supposed to know. Somehow, you've broken the mold. What do we do? Jonathan squeezed his eyes closed and gripped the back of his chair. He hadn't even realized he had stood behind it. His knuckles turned white. Finally, he spoke. If this is the sort of story I think it is, I don't think we have a choice. Either we go through the door, figure out what's behind it, or it is going to come and get us. If we are the main characters, we should be safe. Usually, they survive. Usually? Not always? Usually. Chris looked at Jonathan, then towards the door. All right, then. We might as well get it over with. I'm the sidekick here, then I guess it's my job. I'm the chairist, anyway. Right? I bring light into darkness. I'm the sacrifice. Chris, don't joke about that. Look, I, I don't know. Don't worry. Like you said, we're safe, right? We are the main characters. We never die in the first act. Maybe it'll just end up being a big joke anyway. Though, he was still terrified. Jonathan slowly nodded. He couldn't help but think about that. By breaking their own plot line, they would no longer be safe as the heroes in the story. He feared to the voice, the complaint, as by saying it, he knew he would make it fact. He watched as Chris walked forward and opened the door carefully. The hinges squeaked as it opened, and a cloud of dust came into the kitchen. 
It was clear the door hadn't been opened for a long, long time. Beyond the door was near pitch black. Chris reached into a nearby drawer and took out a flashlight. He turned it on and shone into the darkness beyond, revealing narrow wooden staircase that descended between two stone walls. He walked slowly down the stairs. Jonathan came behind him and followed into the unknown darkness. Chris reached the end of the stairwell and paused. He turned to face into a small room, shining his light around. Dear God! Dear God, John! This isn't a comedy. This is a horror. Jonathan followed his gaze to find his worst fears confirmed. The floor of the room was covered with a fine black dirt. Scattered across it were dozens of broken bones and skeletons, along with ancient weapons. The walls, covered with blood, writings scrawled in dozens of languages from ancient ruins to modern letters, and languages neither person could understand. Run, Chris! We shouldn't have come here! Jonathan shouted as he sprinted up the stairs. The entire building began shaking. The low rumbling he had once thought was thunder became a continuous noise that seemed to come from every direction at once. He ran towards the kitchen, but stopped in the doorway. The cabinets at the far end of the kitchen began to lose their form. They blurred and turned into written word, becoming replaced with descriptions of themselves. A large white cabinet with a silver handle. Small thin cabinet with golden handle. Electric oven. Four stoves on the top. Black with rinse dilt black as black melt slag ad that that ad that 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 the letters began to slide down mixing and forming incomprehensible gibberish before disappearing into their own growing sea of white the blinding bright light advanced forwards absorbing everything into it and leaving the wall of darkness behind jonathan realized that, having found out the truth and broken his role, he had removed the very thing that held his plot together. By going outside of his own story, he destroyed his fictional universe. Chris didn't stop when Jonathan did. He ran into Jonathan's back, and they fell forward. Chris didn't seem to notice what was happening and crawled forward, calling to Jonathan to keep running. No, don't go in there. It isn't real, Jonathan shouted. Chris screamed as he finally saw the walls melt around him. He crawled and crawled back towards the stairwell, but he was overcome with the descending wall of letters. His feet began to change slowly, his face contorted to the look of incomprehensible horror as he saw his legs dissolve into letters. Then he disappeared forever. He kept crawling forward, but nothing he could do would change his fate. Jonathan watched in horror as his friend dissolved into oblivion. The very universe he lived in was dissolving around him. He turned and began to run down the stairs again, preferring the horror of skeletons to the certain death in the kitchen. He stumbled to the bottom and collapsed onto the dirt floor. His head scraped along the ground, forming a large gouge over his right eye that blinded it with blood. With his good eye, he turned to see his fate. The overcoming wall of letters kept coming down the stairs, then stopped at the base. The letters molded together, filling in all the white space, forming a black wall. Jonathan felt it and realized it became a part of the same stone wall that now surrounded him. Using the drop flashlight, he looked around. He was trapped in a square stone room no more than 20 feet across. Jonathan sat in the center of the room, not knowing what to do. Time seemed to slip away, and he had no knowledge of its passing. He had no idea if he were there for minutes, or days, or years, or even centuries. He simply remained trapped, alone, in the darkness. Though, he may have guessed, he was there for days. The flashlight never dimmed. The blood never stopped pouring from his head. There was nothing for him to do, and he felt no reason to move. Alone, with an eternity to himself, he began to contemplate what had happened. He thought of his own life, of his existence, and how he had come to be. He thought about himself. It seemed wrong to think that way. Himself implied he was an actual living being, and he wasn't sure if that was truly fitting. It suited him more to think in the third person, as he would have been writing in the story. Was it fair to say he was ever anything more than that? A fictional creation? 
His thoughts turned over the room. He had no idea where he was, or how the poor souls who'd become the skeletons that surrounded him had found their way into the small, black cell. Perhaps he would join them, perhaps someone else would come to inhabit the small place, and he would be gone forever. Perhaps it already happened, and without a sense of time, he hadn't realized it. The thought sent a chill down his spine, and he didn't know what was worse, an eternal life in a cage, or simply ceasing to exist with no sign that he ever was, with no sense of time in a strange world. Who was to say that it hadn't already happened? Perhaps both were true, and in their own way, he realized he needed to leave some kind of permanent mark so that somehow, maybe another person might know he existed. He had to tell his story. With all the time imaginable to spare, he had no time at all to lose. He thought about what he had to do. After some time, though he had no idea how much, he stood up again. As if compelled by an unseen force, he walked towards the wall, dipped his hand in the blood that flowed from his face, and put it on stone. He made lines that formed letters, then the letters formed words, and finally, the words formed a story. It began. Jonathan sat trembling in the dark. 